Okay, it's two o'clock. Welcome back to the uh, PCR and real-time PCR seminar series. Today, I'm going to talk about troubleshooting. Um, so <laughs> if it can go wrong in PCR, it will. And I really recommend that you do a lot of playing with PCR to try to figure out what sorts of things you can and cannot accomplish when you're doing it. You know, how far can you push a reaction before it fails so that you have a toolbox to go to when your reactions start failing on you and you can go back and say, mm, I think I saw this before when I was just playing around. So anyway, what could go wrong? Well, no amplification when you do want it amplification where you don't want it, multiple amplicons when you only wanted a single amplicon, wrong sized amplicons, and then hidden mutations. So these are things that when you look at your amplicon on a gel, everything looks fine and you don't realize that you're in trouble until farther down the line in your research. All right, so we'll start off with no amplicon when you want one. Here's a lovely gel that I generated at one point. Got absolutely nothing on it except some beautiful ladders. So what went wrong here? Was it a bad reagent? Was it a bad primer? Bad template? Were there PCR inhibitors in my template? Um, one of the very first things that you can check to make sure that uh, you know, it wasn't something easy and simple, is make sure before you put your tubes into the thermocycler that you give them a quick spin. At the bottom right, I have pictures of tubes with bubbles. And the tube on the left with the bubble floating at the top, that's not going to be a problem. Because when the reaction heats up to 95 degrees, that bubble's going to pop. It's the bubble on the right, the bubble trapped at the bottom, that is going to act like a thermos. It's going to protect your reaction from the changing temperatures that are required for the amplification to work. And so if you do a quick spin, you know, it's just a pulse spin, nothing big, um, that will force the liquid down into the bottom and the bubble up to the top. And that will help you a lot. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this decision tree for troubleshooting. And I am starting at kind of a random place. There are so many different ways for PCR to go wrong. So I just chose one. And so this decision tree is not necessarily going to help you um, in all cases, but it's a place to start. So um, imagine you're running a reaction, you have a positive control DNA that you have amplified from before, you know everything's fine, but when you run the reaction, you don't get any amplification, even from that reliable positive control. So what do you do? The first thing to do is to test the primers and the reagents. See, it's not going to be the template because you know the template's good. So you're going to test the primers and the reagents by amplifying. You're going to use the same reagents and all of the same templates, but you're going to use primers that you know have amplified that positive control before. So then there are three things that can happen. You could still get no amplification at all, even your positive control template. In that case, it is very likely that one of your reagents is bad. Another option is that the positive control has amplified before, uh, amplifies this time as well. So that actually narrows things down for you. Your primers and, well, the known primers, but your reagents are fine. So you know that it's the template that's bad. Finally, the next thing that could happen is that the positives amplify your positive control and all of your unknowns amplify 
with these known primers. So you know that your new primers, the ones for this new gene that you're looking for, that the primers are bad. So then there are things that you do in each of these three situations. Um, if it seems like your reagent is bad, amplify with new reagents. And at this stage of the game, don't bother trying to figure out which reagent is the problem. Just set everything aside and go with all new reagents. It's not worth your time. If your, uh, your unknowns template is bad, what you're gonna to wanna to start with is checking that the template quality, so the A260-280 reading, also the A260-230 readings, uh, that those are good. And you want to check your template quantity. So is there not enough DNA that you're adding in? Or are you adding in too much? Because too much DNA can also inhibit PCR. Finally, if it seems like your test primers are bad, you can redesign the test primers. You can uh, try diluting them differently or um, in a different buffer. If you did not dilute them in water, um, you could try diluting them in water second time around. All right, so back to amplifying with new reagents. So, if everything works well now, you have the known primers, you have brand new reagents, and your positives and your unknowns amplify, then that's when you go back and you try amplifying with the test primers that you were working with originally. If there is still no amplification, that is also a possibility. Um, if you check your template quality and quantity, and they're both okay, that's one option. It could be that they're both bad, in which case I recommend you throw them out, or it could be that only one of them is bad and maybe uh, that sample can be, uh, can be rescued. Finally, if you need to redesign your primers, then you're really starting at go again and anything is possible. Okay, so with the new reagents, if you're still not getting any amplification, you might want to look at your target gene. It's possible that there is so much secondary and or tertiary structure that your uh, polymerase just can't get through it. So maybe you need to use a polymerase with a different range of activities. If your quantity and your quality are bad, like I said, re-isolate your DNA or you can further purify. So if you did a purification uh, using an ethanol precipitation method, maybe you wanna take that and uh, run it on a gel and cut it out of, out of a gel. Or maybe you want to run it through one of the uh, DNA extraction uh, filter kits. Let's see, if only one of the, either the quality or the quantity is bad, um, then there are a variety of different things that you can do. So from here, now what? Okay, I'm just kidding. We're not gonna um, go any farther with this because it really, it just gets bigger and bigger. But if you are stuck with a situation and you can't figure it out, my email address and my phone number are at the end of this seminar and just give me a call and I'm happy to chat you through these problems. Okay, reagents. So if nothing is going right, um, it's possible that your reagents are a problem. What sorts of things could be going on with your reagents? Number one, are you using the reagents that came in the same box with the TAC? Um, those, those 10X buffers are not interchangeable between different companies or between different kinds of polymerase that are sold by the same company. If you are an impatient being like myself, 
Um, sometimes you don't feel like you have the time to completely thaw out your reagents. And when you do that, you are getting um, not the concentrations that you think you're getting. And you're also changing the concentration of what remains in the tube. So you are potentially hamstringing everyone else in your lab and that's not a good place to be. If you have freeze thawed your reagents too many times, particularly primers, um, primers can break down with a lot of freeze thawing. And so um, generally what I do when I get a tube of lyophilized primer is I resuspend it to a one millimolar concentration and then I make a working stock from that. And the one millimolar tube goes into the minus 20. And the working stock, um, I might keep that at minus 20. I might just keep it in the fridge. Um, some primers do just fine sitting around in water in the fridge. Um, some of them are a little more sensitive and might degrade in the fridge. And so then it's a balancing act between freeze thawing too many times and degradation in the fridge. Um, I generally stick mine in, in the freezer. Um, it just makes me feel more comfortable, basically. Um, you might just need to change concentrations of some of your reagents. So um, different templates are going to be carrying along different PCR inhibitors. And so maybe you need to use a non-standard concentration of magnesium or BSA to blast through those inhibitors. If you're using, uh, if, if you're not getting any signal and you're doing real-time PCR, check how old your probe is. Um, because of the floor that's attached on one end and the quencher that's on the other end, um, any amount of freeze thawing of probes is bad news. So when you get your lyophilized probe in, instead of making the one millimolar stock concentration that I recommend for regular primers, dilute it all the way out and then make dozens of sub samples of that probe and freeze them. And then you're only going to grab out a couple of tubes at a time when you need them. And anything that's left over in that tube, you're just gonna throw in the trash because freeze thawing a probe more than once is going to be bad. Also, um, a lot of probes do not hold up well, even diluted the way I just mentioned and stored at minus 20 or even at minus 80, they don't hold up well over time. And so if your reactions are starting to look strange um, and your probes are more than six months old, that could very well be the problem. And I would definitely recommend not bothering to work with probes that are more than a year old. Um, finally, the polymerase. Uh, like I said, there are many, many different kinds of polymerase that are designed for dealing with different situations. So you might need a polymerase that can deal with high GC or secondary and tertiary structure or very long amplicons, for example. Um, I have a picture here of reactions that I performed using a kit called the Epicenter Failsafe Kit. And it is a, a tube of polymerase that comes with, I don't know how many is that, 12 um, different buffer systems. And so you can run your template with all of these buffer systems and see which one works the best for your particular situation. Um, what exactly is in each of those buffers is proprietary 
And so if you have been pushed to the point where you are having to use an epicenter fail safe kit to figure out how to get your reaction to work, you are then going to be yoked to that buffer that you purchase from epicenter from then on for that particular reaction. Um, because there's, they will not tell you what is in that buffer because they want you to buy it from them. Okay, so primers, we talked a lot about those already, but one thing to keep in mind is that if you are trying to amplify genes from field isolates, um, the primers that you've designed are by definition from sequences that you know. Field isolates are by definition sequences that you do not know. And so if you're not getting any amplification of field isolates, you might just try primers that are offset a little bit. Maybe you have a mismatch in your sequence right there at the three prime end that is creating a problem. Um, GenBank fails are not unknown. So um, there is not a lot of NCBI curating of sequences that's in Gen, that are in GenBank. Um, so your best bet is to not just choose a sequence out of GenBank, but to look at as many representative sequences as possible out of GenBank and try to design primers that will work for as many possible sequences. Um, secondary structure, of course, sometimes you're backed into a wall and you have to design a primer that's going to give you a hairpin. Um, in that case, you might want to make it a little bit longer so your annealing temperature can be a little bit higher and the likelihood that that hairpin will form during your reaction uh, is minimized. Also, your primer sequences might need degeneracies. So if you are looking to amplify field isolates where some of them have a T at the end, at the three prime end, and some of them have a G at the three prime end, you might need to put in a degeneracy, uh, let's see, TG, I think is an M, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, when you are working with brand newly designed primers, you of course design them shooting for a particular annealing temperature, but that temperature is just theoretical, just calculated, doesn't actually mean anything on the bench. And so um, if your initial calculated temperature isn't giving what you what you want, see if your lab does not have a thermocycler that has a temperature gradient capability. There should be a lab nearby that does and see if they will let you use it so that you can run a temperature gradient and figure out what temperature you should be using for those primers. Um, for primers, I mentioned making a one millimolar stock solution and then um, making working dilutions. If you store them to dilute, so if your working solution is to dilute, you can get DNases in your tubes that will just destroy your primers. Um, and that is the reason that I choose to keep my primers in, at uh, minus 20 instead of four degrees. Also, if you have very small volumes in tubes, you'll notice that over time you'll get crystallization. So you know you put 20 microliters in that tube, you pull it out, there's nothing in the bottom, but there's a crystal on the side. The DNA, of course, will still be at the bottom of the tube, but all the liquid has been crystallized, frozen on the side. And the process of that happening is guaranteed to have destroyed your primers. In my experience, it's not even worth 
thawing the tube out, spinning it down and seeing if the primers will go. I just throw it out and make myself a new dilution. And finally, of course, the, the good old fallback of did I design my reverse primer backwards, meaning is it actually forwards? Okay, so what sorts of things can go wrong with your template? If your template is really sheared or degraded, um, you can get small pieces of DNA acting like primers in your reactions. So you want your template to be as intact as possible. And the gel on the right shows a good DNA prep and a poor DNA prep. The good DNA prep shows a nice sassy band up at, you know, it's gonna be larger than 12 KB. And then a smear that you really, you know, you're going to have to expect anytime you manipulate DNA, it's going to break a little bit. Um, the, the sample at the right, when I did that DNA extraction, I accidentally vortexed it at a time in the procedure that was not a good idea. Um, so when I'm doing a DNA extraction, I never vortex my sample. If I need to do a mixing, I will um, either invert the tubes completely, you know, three, four, five times, and then put it in the centrifuge and, and give it a pulse spin down. Um, or I will hold the top of the tube with one hand and flick the bottom uh, with my other hand just to get it mixed up. Um, after you've done that, you probably also want to spin it down. Um, even if you are careful, you will probably get some spatter up around the top. And that is a really good way to get cross contamination downstream that will give you headaches. Um, of course, your DNA can be contaminated with all kinds of uh, PCR inhibitors. Um, if you are trying to do PCR from an RNA template, you need to make sure that, number one, you remembered to generate the cDNA from the RNA first. Um, so use a one-step kit or make sure that you do both steps. Um, and then, you know, you have the RNA polymerase that is, or, or the, right, all right, um, the, the polymerase that's, that's converting your, your RNA to, to DNA, you need to make sure that that uh, is working as well as your, uh, your TAC polymerase. Templates might have a lot of secondary or tertiary structure. On the bottom left is a picture of a tRNA. So the, the function of tRNA is specifically to grab amino acids and carry it along um, to the synthesis machinery. And so the, the physical structure of the tRNA is part of its intrinsic properties for getting its job done. Um, it's going to be difficult to melt that RNA structure out to be able to PCR through it. And so for something like that, you're going to need higher melting temperatures or adding other uh, reagents into the reaction that will help melt that structure. One of the things that you can add in that helps a lot, particularly if you have high GC content, is 1% uh, DMSO in your reactions. That's one that I have a lot of, lot of luck with. Okay, so that's all for um, if you have no amplification, but clearly a lot of those things are going to work if you also are getting wimpy amplification. Um, the, if you think back to the curves from yesterday, the, the S-shaped curves for real-time PCR, 
when you're doing a standard PCR, what you are looking at is the final concentration of the product. So where those S curves end up at the right hand side of the graph and where they land on that Y axis is very much a stochastic event. Um, it can in part be based on how much template you originally had in your sample. So maybe you just need to add more template. Um, but it could also be because of um, rate limiting factors with your reagents, like you have run out of DNTPs, or you have primer interactions that are slowing down amplification. Um, sometimes the accumulation of the amplicon itself can actually create problems. And so what you might have to do is increase the number of reactions that you're performing and then pool them and use like a, a Kyogen, Kaya quick PCR purification kit to then uh, concentrate your amplicons to uh, the level that you need for downstream applications. Um, let's see, oh, plate edge effects. Um, if you are doing your reactions in 96 well plates, particularly if you are using the sealing tapes, I at least have a lot of trouble getting those tapes to sit down around the edges. And I tend to get a lot of unwanted evaporation in those wells. And that will also ruin your amplification. And so um, I try to avoid the films. If I need to use films, then I move all of my reactions to the interior of the plate. Okay, so here's an example of a complicated template. So in this case, I was amplifying across a cloned region. And I had two amplicons, you'll see here D and E. Um, my primary gene of interest is that big red arrow in the middle. And you can see there's, there's another gene of interest um, heading off to the right. Um, but that, that red gene in the middle is flanked by two different promoters. It's got the IE promoter and this, this beta actin promoter. And the beta actin promoter is really GC rich. It is really a headache. And so when I was amplifying across the IE promoter, my template was giving me a nice, mostly clean band. That is something that I don't have a problem submitting for sequencing. But the amplicons that I was getting uh, with my primers for the E product gave me this very strained ladder. And that came from the amount of GC that was present in the beta actin. What I end up doing is uh, talking to Kevin or the other uh, sequencing staff and asking them to use uh, the, the high GC reagents that they use for their sequencing. Um, they, they have a standard buffer that they use for sequencing, and then they have a buffer that they use for high GC templates. And so ask them um, to use their high GC template. In this case, I ended up using different polymerase to get a single band. I ended up going, I believe, to a PFU polymerase, if I remember correctly. Um, because that product in that second lane is not something that you could send for sequencing and expect to get anything but gobbledygook. That would definitely be a garbage in, garbage out situation. So when you are trying to amplify things 
um, one of the first things you can do is check your GC concentration and make sure that you aren't dealing with a particularly tricky region. Okay, so here is another example of a problem. Here I have uh, two different templates. Um, well, three different templates. I had a positive control and then I had S1 and S2 would be sample one and sample two. Uh, sample two worked well enough that that's an amplicon I could sequence. The smear that I got from S1 um, probably is a result of mispriming. So the primers were sitting down in places on the template and amplifying uh, non-specifically. Um, also, if the DNA was sheared, then those small pieces of DNA could have been acting um, as primers, or there could be uh, a, a PCR inhibitor that was carried along with the DNA uh, purification, extraction and purification that caused problems for the primers to sit down. I wanted to show you the difference between a template smear and a PCR smear. So I showed you earlier um, what a good DNA extraction looked like compared to a bad DNA extraction. And on the left-hand side here, we have T1 and T2. Those are both good DNA extractions. Um, even though the one on you know, T2 gave a smear, that is not a problem. You'll see uh, that I used in, in lens M, that is the same ladder on two different gels. So you can see that the smear, the PCR smear generated in lane S1 was a really high molecular weight smear. And that's a very different problem than a genomic DNA smear. So if you see a smear like that, um, that does not mean that you have overloaded your template and you're just looking at a lot of template added. That is a mispriming smear and, and those smears do look different. PCR inhibitors. PCR inhibitors will always be co-isolated with your template nucleic acid. They're the whole range of what could be a PCR inhibitor is still a black box and how different inhibitors create problems in PCR reactions is still a black box. Um, the two tubes that you see here, the one on the left was DNA that was extracted from soil and the one on the right was DNA that was extracted from bacteria. And you can tell they're not, you know, nice, clear DNA samples. There are different ways that you can clean these up. Um, but no matter how many times you clean a sample, um, there's still going to be something carried along. It's, you're never going to have a sample that's just DNA. What sorts of things can be PCR inhibitors? Just about everything. Um, so from the extraction process itself, I mean, DNA itself can inhibit amplification of DNA. Um, if you include EDTA in your, uh, either your sample collection buffer, so if you're using like an EDTA tube for collecting blood, um, EDTA is a strong chelator and that will bind up the magnesiums that are required for polymerase to work. Salt, SDS and Triton X, phenol, ethanol, isopropanol, all of those things that you commonly use for DNA extractions can cause problems. Um, if you're doing an ethanol precipitation, it is a good idea to put your final sample into a rotovap for a few minutes to drive off any ethanol. If you are using a column kit, 
They always say, recommended, put the column in a third tube that we have not supplied to you and given an extra spin. And I definitely recommend that you do that. Blood has a lot of different things in it that can be inhibitory, including unknowns. Plants have phenolics, polysaccharides, soil is largely a product of degraded plant material and humic acid from uh, rotted leaves is a really potent PCR inhibitor. Um, if you are isolating DNA from soil and your DNA is brown, like in the previous slide, you may be tempted to try to clean that DNA up by running it on an agarose gel and cutting the DNA out. If you do that, the humic acids will bind to your DNA irreversibly and you will never get it to amplify. So don't use that method for cleaning up DNA that you've isolated from soils. Feces have their own problems, including polysaccharides from the mucus layer that's sloughed off. Um, anything that you will find in a tissue cell, so myoglobin, collagen, all of that is in feces because the host or the, the animal's uh, own cells and mucus are part of feces. All of the PCR inhibitors that might come from bacteria, such as lipopolysaccharide, will be found in feces. If you have a pure culture of bacteria and it's a really slimy version, you can do a 0.01 molar wash of your bacteria uh, with NaCl. And NaCl will cut through LPS and that will give you a nice clean pellet um, the first time you spin it down, you'll have a hard pellet at the bottom of your tube, and then you'll have all this white fluffy on top. That's the LPS that you want to get rid of, and salt will just cut right through that. How do you know that you have PCR inhibitors besides, you know, experience? Um, you would like to test any DNA that you extract on a spectrophotometer right out of the chute. So look for 260-280 readings and 260-230 readings. DNA is measured, uh, DNA and uh, RNA are measured at wavelengths of 260. And if you get an A260 reading of 1.8, that indicates pure DNA an A260-280 of 2.0 is pure RNA. If you get a reading that is lower than 1.8, then that indicates that you have contamination with something, and some of those things could be phenol or proteins. Um, if your 260-280 is over 2.0, um, that's not really a problem. You can just say, well, you know, lots of RNA and in there and, and go ahead and, and give it a shot, see if you can amplify. For 260-230s, you want a range of 2.0 to 2.2. If it's lower than that, that means that you have contaminations with carbohydrates, um, phenol, phenolics, various things, and you will probably want to clean that sample up if your reading is higher than 2.2, then that suggests that you use the wrong blank. So um, did you elute your DNA in water and then use a buffer blank on your spec or the other way around? Um, also, if you are diluting your DNA in water, in one lot of water and you use water from a different lot, um, even though it should just be pure H2O, they can and often will have different pHs and that can create a problem for you. 
So try to use the same lot um, when you're blanking your spectrophotometer. Okay, so there are all of these inhibitors. So how do you counteract them? I have used a lot of different methods and a lot of them work a little bit. The best thing that you can do is find the best DNA isolation method for your application. There are a lot of different DNA isolation methods. There are kits out there that are specifically for feces. There are kits out there that are specifically for soil. Um, don't try to blaze your own path with this. Stand on the shoulders of others um, and, and give those kits a chance. Um, Agros gel purification of DNA is a really good way. It's fast, it's easy uh, for cleaning up your DNA. Um, you probably do not want to run your genomic DNA on a gel and then stain it with ophidium bromide and cut that ephidium band out of a gel. Um, ephidium, although it, um, it binds DNA reversibly, still it's not necessarily a good thing to have in your DNA because it is a mutagen. And so it could be adding, um, it could be changing your DNA in ways that will cause you problems downstream. So I recommend cutting your gel in half and staining one half and using that stained gel. Um, I'll put that down on the UV light and put a sheet of saran wrap on top of that and then put the unstained piece on top of the saran, turn on the UV light and use the stained half as a guide for cutting DNA out of the unstained half. DMSO is a very good tool to use, particularly if you have that secondary tertiary structure or GC-rich templates. Betaine also is pretty good um, at blasting through GC-rich templates. Um, alpha casein has problems. I've only had marginal success with it in the past. Uh, PVP can help if you are dealing with soil samples and you have a lot of polyphenols in your, your DNA. CTAB can be good if you are isolating DNA from a very ooey, gluey bacterial cultures. But again, a, a little NACL bath will do you wonders. Glycerol can help. Um, some of these other things down here, I've, I've tried them all but pretty much from beta in down, my success has been really spotty. So um, I would definitely recommend concentrating on your DNA isolation method. And here is an example of why I uh, believe that. I did some work a number of years ago where I was isolating DNA out of feces. So there is a lot of DNA in a gram of feces. There's the eukaryotic DNA, there's the prokaryotic DNA, there's um, you know, viral DNA. And the, the ability to capture all of that DNA, depending on what your final goal is, can be really important. Um, in this case, I used two DNA extraction methods that use glass milk, this silica matrix. Um, I don't think that there are a lot of kits out there these days that use that. Um, if you're using glass milk, what happens is the DNA, the negatively charged DNA is attracted to the positively charged silica. Um, with genomic DNA, different ends of a molecule can be attracted to different silica beads. And so if you're using a silica matrix, you really 
do not want to vortex that. That will shear your DNA like crazy. So be careful when you're working with a silica matrix. Um, you can see that I did not get all of that much DNA out when I used a silica matrix. And that is because the uh, silica does have a limited binding capacity, just like the silica filters. So um, I'm sure you're all very um, used to using chiagen kits. Those little bitty columns have little bitty silica filters in them, and they use the same method as a silica matrix without having that problem of, of ripping your DNA to shreds. Um, and those filters have a certain level of binding capacity. If you're using ethanol precipitation, depending on the method, you can pull down a lot of DNA that you would never know was there if you were isolating using a silica filter. And when you're isolating DNA from tissue samples, from soil, from feces, from anything that has a lot of DNA in it, um, you can expect, you should expect to be losing one to two logs of the possible DNA available to you if you're gonna use a silica-based method. Um, if you are isolating from uh, serum or something like that, that has very little DNA in it to begin with, then the difference is not going to be so stark. Okay, so what do you do about PCR inhibitors in your sample? You know they're there, you can't get rid of them. How are you going to be sure that the lack of a band in your amplification is because there truly was no target or because PCR inhibitors in your template killed your reaction? The best way around this is to use an internal amplification control. And this Hurfar paper that I have cited down at the bottom is a reference that I would really recommend you get and go through with a fine tooth comb. He talks about two different kinds of internal amplification controls, competitive and non-competitive versions. With a competitive internal amplification control, you're going to use a synthetic piece of DNA. So either um, a previous PCR amplicon that you've cleaned or a plasmid that contains your gene of interest. And that piece of synthetic DNA is going to have the same primer binding sites on it that you are trying to amplify from your template DNA. So it's considered competitive because the primers, the two different templates are competing for the same primers. When you are developing a competitive internal amplification control, there are some things to keep in mind. You want to use the lowest concentration of control in your reactions that you can get away with because it is competitive you don't want to have a lot of your plasmid that sucks up all of the primers and your gene of interest isn't visible. Um, so it's a good idea to do a dilution series to figure out not only what is the lowest amount you can get away with, but what is the lowest amount you can get away with reproducibly consistently. So maybe you can see 10 copies of your control in the reaction, but you only see that 50% of the time. So then you would probably want to go to uh, 100 copies of your control in a reaction. It is a very good idea for your internal amplification control to give you a product size that is different from your target size so that when you're running them on a gel, you can tell them apart 
And when you do that, you want your internal amplification control product to be larger than your target. Because it's a larger fragment, the processivity of the tack means that tack is more likely to fall off while that product is being made. So the larger a product is, the slower it is to amplify. So that means that very short products have a competitive edge over longer products. This is why real-time PCR uses such short amplicons. So make sure that your internal control product is larger than your target. You want the, uh, the amplicon sequence itself to be very similar GC. Um, you might want to use exactly the same sequence, but add a little bit um, in or use a larger part of the same gene for your internal control. Um, and there are different ways that you can use it. You can add it to your sample prior to DNA extraction. If you do that, then that internal control is acting as a control for your extraction as well as your PCR reaction. If you are comfortable with your extractions or if uh, putting the internal amplification control into your samples is not going to work for your applications, then you can add the control to your master mix prior to adding the template. So add the internal amplification control to your big tube of master mix before you aliquot that out into your PCR tubes so that you have exactly the same amount in each tube. Don't try to pipette a tiny little volume of your IAC repeatedly into different tubes. So uh, competitive amplification controls have the advantage in that the primers are the same. And if the target sequence is the same or very similar, then you're going to have very, very similar amplification efficiencies. And you don't have to worry about the difference in amplification efficiency creating confusion. Um, potentially, you end up with an amplification control that amplifies, you know, that has a competitive con advantage of amplification over your target. You don't want that. However, because you are using the same primers for your control and your target, that might decrease your, decrease your sensitivity. And so here is a picture of a dilution series where I have the internal amplification control and the target both in each reaction. Um, all four of these reactions have 100 copies of the control and from left to right, uh, a thousand to one copies of my target. And um, you can see that as the target product decreases, the amplification control product increases. So there is competition between the templates for those primers. Now, non-competitive internal amplification control is a very similar idea. Um, except that you are using two different primer pairs. So you can approach this a couple of different ways. You can use a synthetic piece of DNA with primer set A um, that you have included with your genomic or your, your template DNA that you want to amplify with primer set B. Or you can use primer sets A and B to amplify different regions of the same uh, template DNA. So maybe you know that that uh, housekeeping gene is going to be on that genome, but you don't know whether or not that particular variant of your gene of interest um, is going to be there. And so you can use different primers for those two amplifications. 
In this case, you want to uh, use a lower concentration of the internal amplification control. So you want to limit the amount of amplification that you get from your control so that it does not use up all of the DNTPs and polymerases that you really would prefer to have uh, your target gene be using. The advantage for a non-competitive internal amplification control is that it can be kind of universal. So maybe your lab has developed a primer pair um, for a housekeeping gene and different people in the lab are working on, on different genes and everybody's using the same housekeeping gene. Uh, ABI uses this for their diagnostic test kits. They have what they call a Xeno control that you purchase separately from them. Um, it is a particular primer pair with a particular target. Um, their Xeno control is labeled with hex and then they have you uh, use a or no, it, it's ABI, so they don't use HEX, they use VIC. VIC and HEX are very similar, um, but VIC is specifically an ABI product, whereas HEX can be purchased anywhere. Um, so you, you would want to use a FAM label on your gene of interest if you're going to use ABI's Xeno as your non-competitive internal amplification control. Uh, the downside of this is that you have two different primer pairs and two different target sequences, so your reaction kinetics are going to be different. And so that may throw a ringer into your particular application, and that is something that you just have to try. Here is an example of an internal amplification control that we created in our laboratory. We test for, um, we test vaccines for contamination with extraneous agents. So, you know, we don't want different viruses contaminating different vaccines. So we have to test for a lot of different viruses. And so we have one plasmid that contains targets for all of our DNA viruses and one plasmid that contains targets for all of our RNA plasmids. Uh, viruses, sorry. And so in this case, um, this plasmid has primer binding sites for six different uh, virus amplicons. In each case, the amplicon um, is larger than the wild type amplicon would be. As a necessity, they are not all the same sequence inside. So, you know, you can't imagine that the, uh, the porcine circovirus uh, sequence is going to overlap with the chicken anemia virus. Um, these are sequences that are not necessarily representative, but the primers are specific for those sequences. Also, in this particular case, I have um, engineered in a sequence that binds to a piece of the platypus lactase gene. I figured I should never ever get a sample that has platypus anything in it. And so um, it's a very unique sequence. And so I can use that for um, a universal real-time uh, probe and in this case, uh, one of the viruses, the amplicon is short enough to be a, a real-time control using that probe. Um, okay, so I already talked about the Xeno controls, got ahead of myself, but uh, this is the example of, of that. Um, they, ABI uses it to help determine what CT should be used. Um, to help figure out what the cutoff is, the cycle cutoff. So they, they have you add 20,000 copies of the Xeno control to a sample before you do your DNA extraction. And then if you elude it, um, 
according to the manufacturer's instructions, then you end up with about 222 Xeno copies per microliter of your template. And then if you add the amount of template into the reaction that they recommend, you end up with about 1,500 copies. And then for um, their real times, they say um, a, a valid test to, to say that their, their diagnostic kit has given you a valid test, your internal amplification control should give you a CT between 27 and 34. So this is, is a very nice tool to use. Okay, so what if you get an amplicon when you don't want one? This is likely from priming, mispriming, sorry, or a contaminated reagent. And one of the best ways to approach dealing with mispriming is to just increase the annealing temperature. Um, a lot of times a, a mispriming happens just at the three prime end. When you design your primers, if your three prime end is GC rich, that end can sit down um, in random places of the genome, but it's not going to be the length of the entire primer. And so if you just increase your annealing temperature a bit, um, you can often get rid of that. How do your reagents get contaminated? Probably the biggest way is how you are opening your tubes. Um, if you are opening your Eppendorf tubes one-handed, like the picture on the right, and you use your thumb to pop open that lid, many times when you do that, your thumb is going to be hitting the underside of that lid. And uh, the glow-in-the-dark picture there uh, just shows some work that some folks did where they added a, a fluorescent dye into a tube and they had somebody opening the tube like that and then showed what happened. So, you know, you get it on, the, on your thumb and then it gets on the tube and it gets on your pipettes and, and it's all downhill from there. So I recommend that you either use two hands to open your tubes or keep your tube in the rack and use one hand to lift the lid or to um, purchase one of these 70 cent uh, tube openers and use those for opening your tubes. Um, also, if you are using one tip to make a lot of aliquots, you should just drop the liquid into the tube and not set your tip on the side of the tube if you set your tip on the side of the tube, you are assuming that the inside of that tube is clean. And if for some reason, one of your tubes is not clean, it contains some DNA, then you have spread that uh, contaminant out through everything that you are testing. You have probably cross-contaminated whatever large aliquot of liquid you're using and uh, ruined a reagent for your lab mates. And so, um, you know, it's, tips are expensive, but they're not as expensive as your time. Uh, spatter transfer is also a large one. So anytime you're pulling tubes out of the fridge or the freezer, spin them down before you open them. Keep the tubes closed when you're not using them. And any time that you think you may have splashed up on the side or at the lid, give it another pulse spin. You know, it's an extra two seconds of your time that will pay off in the end. How do you beat PCR contamination? Besides what I just mentioned, there are different levels of protection that you can use. So with engineering controls, would be your biosafety cabinet or using different either physical areas for setting up your reactions 
compared to where you do your DNA extractions, compared to you know where you run your gels, um, or you can separate those activities out by time with a good cleaning in between. You know, use a, a bleach wipe down. If you use bleach, always follow up with an ethanol wipe down because if you are working in a, a hood, bleach will corrode your hood like crazy um, and you it will corrode the insides of your pipettes. When you are cleaning your pipettes with bleach, don't squirt them with your squirt bottle. Squirt into a, a Kim wipe and then wipe them down with that because if you squirt it in, it's going to get into the works and then it's going to start uh, rusting the inside of your pipette, and then of course your pipette is no longer certified and everything goes downhill. Um, okay, so the next level is equipment like gloves. So it's really easy to um, switch out your gloves every time you think that they might be contaminated or um, you, you know that you've touched something you shouldn't. I really like using pre-packaged, pre-sterilized filter tips. They are also expensive. They are also less expensive than my time. Um, the things above, the engineering controls and the safety equipment will not protect you, will not protect your research if you don't follow the work practices of decontaminating your workspace, your pipettes, your hands, um, if you're not careful about opening your tubes, um, if you're not careful about centrifuging down tubes, or if you get sloppy about reusing tips. There is nothing that your engineering controls or your safety controls will do to protect you from yourself. So you are your first line of defense. There is a tool, a, a tool sorry, that you can use. It's called uracil and glycosylase, UNG. Um, this is something that you can put into a PCR reaction. You have to buy these master mixes special. Um, the DNTPs that are included, instead of having a DTTP in the DNTP mix, it's a DUTP. So if your template is as shown at the top and your primer um, ha also has the T's, you run your reaction with the UNG master mix. And the UNG master mix includes these modified DNTPs and the uracil N-glycosylase. The PCR product that you get from that initial run, instead of having the T's, has use in it. So then you run your gel, maybe you get some PCR product on your pipette, whatever. Um, the, the next PCR that you do, if you happen to have that first PCR product contaminating your, your new master mix, the UNG in the master mix will degrade all of these RNA amplicons that uh, you generated in your first round. And that happens while you're setting up your reaction, you know, at room temperature. And, and then as your reaction heats up to 95 degrees and that first, uh, first denaturation step, then the UNG is denatured, so it does not then chew up the PCR product that is being made in that second round of amplification. So if you're going to be doing a lot of the same kind of PCR, like you work in a diagnostic lab, this is a really nice tool to have in your back pocket. Um, if you start seeing amplicons of the wrong size, it's quite possible that you're dealing with the wrong template. It's quite possible that your primers are bad. So refer back to everything we talked about on day two. Um, 
definitely do a blast search and of your primer sequences and make sure that there isn't something else in your uh, target in your template that those primers will bind to. This is an example of how um, the specificity of a primer can be good for you or be bad for you. So in this example at the top, I got a really fat band in my negative control. Um, what I was trying to do was discriminate between a wild type and a mutant. The mutant had just a two base pair deletion and I needed to use PCR to tell the difference. So when I designed my reverse primer, I designed the three prime end to be right at that deletion. And this is a, this is one of those good thing, bad thing, like the degenerate primers. So in this case, I was able to design primers so that my, my wild type primer, reverse primer, would give me my wild type uh, sequence, but it would also give me some of this deletion sequence. When I used a primer that was designed specifically to the deletion sequence, then I was getting nice, clean positives and negatives. But I needed to have both primers. I needed to use both in my experiment to show for sure that I was dealing with the mutant and not the wild type. Template switching. Um, this is one of those hidden problems that you can see farther down, but um, you this will also give you uh, strange amplicon sizes, so you'll start getting multiple um, multiple amplicons in your sample. So this is a polymerase processivity problem where you start to get some amplification, your polymerase falls off, and then you know that happens right at the end of the cycle, and so your temperature has started going back up. There's no chance for a new polymerase to land there and finish the amplification. So you've started to get some partial amplicons in your sample. Well, maybe in the next round, the three prime end of that partial amplicon sits down on a different part of the template DNA. And since you didn't design that primer, you didn't design that three prime end, it's easy for that to happen. Um, so, this is something that you can see if your elongation time is not long enough. Um, and you can get rid of it by increasing elongation time or by using attack with better processivity. Here's an example of something very strange that happened to me. Um, I was dealing with a product where a single gene had been cloned in two directions. So it was identical sequences run off two different, uh, two different promoters um, in the opposite direction. And when I performed PCRA, it gave me the amplicon size that I thought I was going to get. So, you know, a, about one and a half KB. When I used primers, you know, the, the forward primer and then the reverse primer to get amplicon G, I was expecting a larger product. I was expecting about 2 KB. And instead, I only got 200 base pairs. And the same thing when I used uh, primers for an even larger product. Um, in this case, I got an amplicon that was 500 base pairs. When I sequenced those short amplicons, what I discovered was that those, those repeated genes had cut themselves out. And it took a lot of digging in the literature, um, but 
what happened, what appears to have happened is that the DNA in the tube was making these hairpins and then I was amplifying across the bottom of the hairpin and losing the sequences of the genes themselves. Um, and we were not able to figure out using any kind of PCR method, whether or not this was a product that was only happening in the tube, or if it was possibly also um, in the in vivo system, you know, was, was the gene being cut out in vivo or was it a function of TAC? There was no version of PCR, including next-gen sequencing because next-gen sequencing is based on PCR that would tell us the answer. And so we ended up using Southern blotting to address this question because Southern was the only method I could come up with that would give me an answer to the question. Another hidden mutation is chimeras. We uh, discussed this briefly when someone asked a question. A chimera is when PCR accidentally gives you an amplicon that is uh, one species on one end and a different species on the other. So this often happens when you're doing metagenomic studies, looking at um, microbial communities, looking at the uh, rhizobial Ribo, oh, goodness, ribosomal 16S genes. So you have a lot of those genes with different but very similar sequences. And so uh, again, this can be a processivity problem. Um, and GenBank is full of these sequences that you see at the bottom that are not real. Um, it was recognized maybe 10, 15 years ago that GenBank is full of these sequences. They have not been curated out, um, but GenBank has put in place a tool. So if you are submitting uh, 16S metagenomic data to them, you are required to put your sequences through this Chimera check program to make sure that you are not submitting more of these chimeras. Um, but do be aware that they are in the database. So I'm gonna talk about uh, troubleshooting that's specifically for real-time PCR. So here's a picture of an amplification in which I got a really strong signal in a no template control. Um, can I just kind of ignore that and go with the data for my unknowns? Because like maybe my other no template controls were fine. It was just, you know, it's a one-off. Everything else is fine. Um, no, you really need to do it over. Um, you don't know where that contamination came from. You don't know if it came off your finger um, and just contaminated that one well. You don't know if it's a contamination of a reagent at a really low level. And so it could be in other reactions also. Um, so you just, you can't rely on these data. If you see amplification in a no template control and you're using cyber green, that could be because you're getting primer dimer amplification. Um, cyber will pick up primer dimers, whereas a TACMAN application will not. And so with a cyber uh, signal, no template control signal, particularly if you see it routinely, you're going to have to redesign those primers. If you're getting amplification in a no template control, a good thing, a good tool to use is called multi-component data analysis. So this is where you look at the data coming just out of a single well, but you're looking at the accumulation of light for all of the different wavelengths. So 
This was for a multiplex that I was using uh, a FAM and HEX to look at two different targets. And then I had the ROCKS internal control. And if you see something like this and you have an actual inflection point in one of your, your HEX or your FAM that you do not see in your ROCKS, um, that inflection point shows that it is a true positive, as in your, your sample might not really be a positive, but it, your no template control has some contamination in it. It's not a fluke. Um, there are other things that can happen. So for instance, if you see a steady increase in fluorescence, um, where your rocks is flat, then uh, that indicates that you had some DNA degradation in your tube. Your probe was being degraded over time and there is no inflection point. This is just a degradation um, and probably you are okay. If you do a multi-component data analysis and you see a increase in the fluorescence in all of the different dye signals, um, particularly rocks, then that suggests that what happened in that well was evaporation. So all of your fluorophores got more concentrated over time. And uh, this is not going to be a problem. You don't need to rerun all of your, uh, your samples, you can look at your plate and see which ones have evaporated and leave those out of your analysis if you need to. So when you're working at the limit of detection, here is an example of uh, two different samples right at the limit of detection. And for both of them, I am getting a positive signal and a negative signal. Um, and this is because of stochastic pipetting. If you have just one target sequence per mil, then only some low percentage of the time will you actually pipette that piece of DNA into your reaction. So you, right at the limit of detection, you need to increase the replicate number for your reactions. You can also detect PCR inhibition when you're looking at real-time data. You look at your, uh, your curve, and if you do a dilution series, a tenfold dilution series of some unknown, look at your R squared. It should be greater than or equal to 0.98, just like you would do with any standard uh, dilution series control. In this case, you can see that the R squared is low. If I break that into two different uh, groups of data, then you can see that at the lower concentration, so the higher dilutions, the, the more you've diluted out any PCR inhibitors, then the PCR is not inhibited and you're getting good R squared. But when the DNA is concentrated, the PCR inhibitors are also concentrated and you're getting um, not so good uh, slope. Um, your R squared is good, but your slope is bad. So in this case, you might consider doing dilutions of the DNAs that you've extracted for all of your targets. If you start getting crazy curves like this, probably what has happened is your signal has come up really early and the software is including that signal in its baseline. And so if you, you get curves like this, the first thing to do is go into the software and reset the baseline. So if you're getting a curve that comes up at 12 cycles, back that baseline off 
to nine cycles and your curves will probably straighten themselves out. Um, it's possible that your DNA contains some autofluorescers that are giving you weird things. In that case, um, again, the solution to pollution is probably dilution. Um, but you, you cannot get any workable data from curves that look like this. You're going to have to do some kind of manipulation. And finally, um, what does it actually look like? What does it look like when you have PCR inhibitors in your sample? There's this really neat paper, uh, Opal et al. from 2010, where they include differing concentrations of different compounds that are known to inhibit PCR. And um, in this example, they added different concentrations of calcium to their reactions. Calcium competes with magnesium and will inhibit polymerase. So you can have two different kinds of PCR inhibitors, the ones where the polymerase is inhibited and the ones where the DNA is all locked up. If you have a polymerase inhibitor, what you see is that as the inhibitor concentration increases, the reaction slopes change and the final concentrations decrease. And that's because your polymerase is not working very well. You can run a, um, a melting curve on these, particularly if um, the, the melting curve piece of the data is available to you, even if you are running um, TACMAN, but it won't give you signal. So you can only see these kinds of signals if you have cyber in your reaction. Um, I suppose that if you had run some reactions and were getting weird things and you wanted to check, you could open up your tubes and add some cyber. I don't know. I've never tried it, but it's an idea. Um, but when, when polymerase is changed, uh, is inhibited, and not that the DNA is locked up, you're going to get the same amplicons, just different amounts of that same amplicon. So they're all going to have the same sequence. You just have differing amounts of it. And so your curves are all going to be the same shape. If you have a PCR inhibitor that binds onto target DNA, as opposed to binding the, the polymerase, um, what you'll see is that the final concentrations stay the same. So it's being made, um, but the CT is delayed. Um, so it's not being made as fast. Your PCR efficiency is the same. Polymerase has not been modified, um, but there's just less target that is available. And uh, for instance, humic acid is one of the ones that binds onto DNA. That's why if you try to clean humic acid out of um, your template DNA by running it onto a, an agarose gel and cutting it out, um, your DNA just gets locked up. It's because the humic acid is interacting directly with the DNA and not with the polymerase in your reactions. A, a PCR inhibitor that binds onto the DNA, if you do a melting curve, you will get a lot of different curve shapes. And why this happens is a mystery to me. I have reread this paper a number of times trying to figure it out. They don't actually offer anything up. They just say, this is what we see regularly. Um, and so I am unclear on why you get these curves. And maybe if any of you um, have any information about that, you could send it on to me. I would appreciate that. Okay, so that is it for the PCR seminar series. And I want to thank everyone who helped me create it. And again, really, Crystal, thank you 
so much. And Hannah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, my contact information is at the bottom. Please do not be shy. I am here as a resource. Please use me. Are there any questions? No questions. Okay. Well, if there are no questions because you are just learning about PCR and you haven't gotten to the point yet where you are trying to troubleshoot, um, my, my offer of help is just stands open. Um, I, you don't have to need help right now. If you need help three years from now, please contact me, that's fine. Um, I realize that if you don't have a problem that's you know, right now bugging you, you might not remember the details. Um, if you have come up with a novel way to kill a PCR reaction, please let me know. Um, I have killed PCR every way I can think of. And um, I know that there are more ways to do it. And if you discover one, I want to know about it. So that's how you can pay me back, is by letting me know what you can break, please. OK, well, thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate your time and your attention and your patience with me, particularly during that first seminar when things uh, didn't go so smoothly. So have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Good. I did have a question. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, question, but then she like I literally typed to her and I'll interrupt you in a second. And mm -hmm. if she's gone, like she went off the call. So I was like, well, oh. I can't really help you with it.